Welcome to the final Para 9 spoiler video. This is obviously starting quite a bit sooner than the time that our spoiler is supposed to go live, but our spoiler cards will go live at right about the time that you were expecting. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's our last is because we are hoping to start a family, and so we told LSS this will be the last one. So. Yeah, and this story was many months in creation. I was writing it quite a bit before I knew anything about the spoiler card, but it just so happened that the story that I was writing, set in the pits as it were, works quite nicely with these cards. And so for the next 50 odd, 55 odd minutes, you will witness if you want to stick around to a audio drama kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of like Prairie Home Companion, which is something you used to listen to when you were a kid. Yeah, it's a little bit more like, I mean, yes, yeah, but it's it's old-timey radio shows, The Shadow, Gunsmoke, things of that nature, hmm. where they've got sound effects and everything. The sound effects are minimal. They're all done by my brother, all the background sound, and then there is a cameo at the end by Dead Summer. So thank you for being a part of the channel. The channel itself has been through many different phases, but I would say that the flesh and blood phase was my favorite. So it's been fun, and we'll see you around. Yeah, the lore will stay up, but you're not going to see much new here. I'm going to record the second Arachne story once that comes out. Don't know what I'll be doing after that, but you might hear my voice around. Maybe. All right, bye. Bye. Chapter 1 The cavern was hundreds of meters deep. Shops and homes alike lined the stone walls, stacked one above the next in a network of desperate humanity. Walkways and ladders and ropes, hanging lanterns and lines of drying clothing wove between around and along gargantuan pillars of both natural and man-made formation. A man's yell clawed its way up from somewhere near the lowest levels. His cry was caught and strangled into oblivion by the jumble of shantytown architecture. A laugh suffered the same fate. Morio conversation, the incessant soundtrack of this depraved place. Down, down, all the way down on the very bottom of the cavern, a trio of erectus grinning hounds slavered and laughed in their pursuit of a lone female. Her cloak, moth-eaten, torn, muddy, flapped in her wake. She stumbled around from the quartet of pursuers. Yes, four, even though we've only seen the three aforementioned. Those three dogs, pockmarked, missing teeth, one with only half a working face. The other two, with bodily rashes, do the fourth's bidding. He, no better looking than the previous three, has, at least, bathed in the past month. He wore a long jacket a size too big, and hobbled as best he could with one bad leg and a cane. Don't let her away! He hollered. His words drifted upward toward metrics, to mingle and dance with so many other shouts and cries. Another note added to the miserable song. She whimpered, inarticulate nothings, pleading to no one and to anyone for an escape from her nightmare. Behind her, 
The laughter closed in. A pointed, there she is, was followed by, we've got you now. Her foot caught in a puddle of mud and she fell. She struggled to her feet. Her face watched her from an ajar door, then pulled back half an inch and shut the scene away. Back on her feet, she ran, or tried to. The mud was thick. The best she could do was heave and lunge and throw herself forward. Her pursuers were close, so close she could hear their frustrated grumbling. Another two meters and she would make it to a section of wooden walkway laid over the muddy cavern floor. As soon as she reached the wood, she spun and drew a large vial from a pocket lining the inside of her cloak. Inside the glass... A reddish vapor begged for release. She threw it at the three, still in the mud, then covered her face. Nothing happened. She dropped her arm. The vial was stuck in the mud and very much intact. In the span of time she could have ran, one of the three grabbed her ankle and yanked. Gavin's cane tap, tap, tapped across the wooden walkway. <clears throat> Might have gotten away if you just run. Too clever for that, though, huh? He leaned his weight into his cane and held her thrown vial up to dirty light, cast across the scene from a dozen sources. A candle in a window, a flickering gas street lamp, a lantern hanging from a storefront sign. Gavin started to kneel, but stopped after only a few inches and winced. Me bumped one of his goons with his cane, said, Get her up! The one she'd mentally named Droopy, on account of the right side of his face drooping, looped an arm under hers and lifted. Get this off her! Gavin nudged her cloak with the tip of his cane, and was quick to add, Careful, she's got bombs and shit in there. He gave the vial of red gas a soft jiggle. Shake it real hard. Kat suppressed a laugh and tried to take a step back, in case he did. Gavin froze. <laughs> Funny, is this where it went? Kat shook her head and tutted. No, I made your junk. Different ingredients. <clears throat> and? Gavin whined his eyes. She gave him a confused look. Where's my stuff, cat? She nodded toward her cloak. I gave it to you? She said, and he started laughing. <laughs> you, you, gave, you gave me half, he spat. You owe me... He tilted his head back and closed one eye, then the other, pondering. Where's my other thirty doses of rehype? The iron bars clanged shut, and Kat threw herself into them. How long are you keeping me here? Hey! She yelled. Droopy turned back. Karen said I'll see you when he's free. Do I get any food or water or anything? A book? Droopy lifted the left side of his face, the side that still worked, in what he thought was an are you kidding scowl. It ended up being a distorted mix of a couple would be nice and I think I shot myself look. Cat shuddered. Fucking a, he's ugly, she thought, and crossed her arms. She slunk into the corner of her lightless cell. Or was it a room? The walls were wood. At least... No. Only one was. Strange. The wall opposite the bars was entirely stone, 
as was the one to its right. But the last one was wood. She began knocking, little tap taps, up and down, side to side, listening for many hollows or weak sections. She was working her way up the side of the left wall when a door down the hall opened and footsteps approached. Gavin was alone. He'd taken his long coat off and wore leather suspenders over a dirty gray shirt. His pants, three sizes too big, slopped around his waist as he hobbled down the hall with the aid of his cane. On reaching her, he took hold of a bar and cracked his cane against one. Sit down! No. He huffed a sigh. Why are you such a pain in my ass? Cat lunged for him, hand grasping for his shirt. He caught her in the chest with an adroit upward flick of his cane. <laughs> None of that. Let me go, Gavin. No. We had a deal, and you failed to deliver. Here's the new deal. You make me sizzle and I'll give you food. No sizzle? He let the question hang for her to finish. No food? He winked. <laughs> Good girl. When can I expect my first batch? Hmm? I, I can't make you anything down here. I can't even see it. Above her, a long gas lamp sputtered to life. Then the floor shook and she threw her arms out to stop from falling. It was over as soon as it began. Now there was only a slow rumble. The one wood wall was sinking into the floor. More lights came on and lit an entire laboratory. Glass, beakers and vials, flame burners and scales, three sizes of pestle and mortar, Cork toppers, shakers, spinners, and mixers. The room was full of every alchemical apparatus, ingredient, and tool she could have dreamt of. I want a quarter crate's worth within three days. I need a week. You have three days? It takes a, a, a full two just to cure. Gavin shrugged. I'll make sure you have a constant supply of tea. Chapter 2 The stone whispered along the blade's edge and made the metal sing when lifted away. Again, the stone traveled the length of steel. Whisper, ring, whisper, ring. Another couple settled persuasions, and he tested the edge with a bit of paper. He drew the paper along the blade and was rewarded with a thread-thin ribbon. His tool of trade was a long, blunt-tipped blade. Longer than a knife, but... Not quite long enough to be called a sword of any sort. It rather resembled an oversized barber's razor. A drunken slur was followed by a burst of wood-on-wood -wood scraping, then a thud. The murmur of conversation that had been the only sound in the bar a moment ago was silenced by the sudden outburst. A swing drunkard stood next to a fallen bar stool and fumbled for something in his coat, muttering to himself. He wobbled and turned a half circle and was cracked over the head with a blackjack from behind. He crumpled to the floor, landing with all the grace and melody of a dropped sack of potatoes. Hey, you're blocking the Path. Tanner slapped his bar top. Get him up, he said to the attacker. Well, oh, not a chance. 
I ain't helping his ass. You hear what he said? <laughs> ass if I... Tanner stared the speaker in the eyes and mouthed a bunch of nothings in mock. Don't want to hear it. Get him out of here. The attacker dragged his victim out of the bar by the feet. A spotty trail of drippled blood marked the path of the man's head. Tanner threw a wet rag onto the counter and told the blackjack wielder to clean that up too. With the excitement over, the chatter returned to its typical midday volume set amidst the dirty perfume of old beer and cigar smoke. Cynic sheathed his blade and rolled a taste of disgust into a wad of saliva and spat it into his empty glass then pushed it away from the bar's edge. Near his right elbow, a section of the bar, about the size of a fist, was missing and his eyes lingered there for a moment. Tanner wrapped the bar top with his middle knuckle. Senek wiped his mouth with the back of his sleeve. You good to talk? Tanner nodded. As long as everyone behaves. He gave his bar a sweeping look. What's the offer? Ears. Uh, need at least two pairs, but he prefer... What? I'm not adding to Crapier's collection. He pays good. Six silver per pair. You ever cut the ears off someone? <laughs> Didn't think so. People like their ears, and they really don't like it when you try and cut them off. I don't want it. Tell me you've got something else. And Tanner worked his mouth and reached under the bar. Felt around and tried to find where he'd put those damn cards. Ah, there. He grabbed the stack of thick paper and started going through them. He considered the second, then shook his head and continued. On the fifth, he paused, rocked his head and pulled it from the rest. What's that? Thieving. Uh, interested? No hits. N no, Tanner said, but not before a noticeable pause. No. Cynic leaned a little deeper against the bar. Tanner sighed. If I'm being honest, I do have a hit, yes, but the client specifically asked for someone else. Who? Tanner shook his head. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Look, I told them I'd hold the contract for a week. It's been four days. If... A boisterous, hacking <laughs> shout cut through the pair's conversation, and Tanner jerked upright to see what new hoopla was afoot. A patron was standing and waving his hands about his head, ducking and gesturing at unseen assailants, but he was smiling. Laughter followed as the speaker continued the dramatic telling of a story. It's an open contract, then, Cynic said. In three days, I mean. Yeah, Tanner said. Do this one in the meantime. With a single finger, he pushed the card across the bar. On the card's front was a crude image of a hand pinching a small trinket from a drawer. This is so stupid. Cynic spun the card around and read the back. Candace DeBoer shall be separated from her thrice-valued locket. Twelve silver paid on delivery. He pursed his lips and nodded in approval. Huh. Twelve? That's not bad at all. What's this thrice-valued bit about? Tanner shrugged. Eh, no idea. He pushed away from the bar, said, Hang on, and wandered off to fill a patron's glass. Cynic ran a finger of his left hand along one of five grooves that marred the bar top. He stood and pulled the hood of his waxed shawl up over his head and was making to leave when Tanner called to him. I, I said hang on. You heading off for that already? Why not? 
Sooner I get it done, the sooner I get paid. You need another dose? Sinek shook his head. I'm fine. And worked the fingers of his right hand. Servos, wires, pistons, cables, pivoting joints and bearings all worked together to bring his brass and steel arm up into the bar's yellow lamplight. He spread his fingers wide, spun the hand a full circle a few times and tapped his head. See? Sure, but I saw you do this too. Tanner pointed to the missing section of the bar. And this? He pointed to the five deep claw grooves scarring the wood. I paid you for those. No. Yeah, no, I know you did. That's not my point. I'm fine. Don't kill her, okay? Who? For fuck's sake, Cynic. Miss DeBoer. Candace? Just the locket. I don't kill for fun, Cynic said, and headed out. As the bar door closed, he stepped into the dim and dank of the pits, smiled, and added, Usually. Chapter 3 Steam rose from the pot as Cad poured the fresh batch of sizzle into a large tray. Now a liquid, but over the next 48 hours it would cool and harden and turn brittle. Gavin sat across the table, arms crossed. The bottom edge of his goggles wore a soft hint of breath fog. This is the first time I've ever seen him made. You told me that. Cat scraped every last remnant from the large pot with a wooden spatula, then added the tray to a rack where five others were already cooling. How many vials will this get me? Gavin waved steam out of his face. About two hundred per tray. Gavin whistled. <whistles> now that's what I'm talking about. He tapped his cane to pull Cat's attention. So, <clears throat> hey, this was fun, but it's not why I'm down here. I get to go? What? <laughs> Fuck no. Where's the rest of the rehype you owe me? She scrunched her face in confusion. What are you talking about? I gave it to you. No. Gavin cracked his cane against the ground. You gave me 30 doses. Where's the other 30? I need more pulse and nectar. No, 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 no. Are you trying to fuck with me? Have you looked around? Huh? Cat, do you see where you are? Yeah, your weird sex dungeon. <sighs> Don't give me ideas, you little shit. I'm not that little. Shut up. Just <sighs> shut the fuck up. You promised me 60 doses out of those two jars. I miscalculated. Cat cut in. Of, of Paulson. Oh, please, miscalculated by half? You just made a batch of sizzle from memory. I might not be the brightest in the pits, but I'm not the dumbest either. That was true on both accounts. And her attempt to pass as an idiot wasn't working. She needed to convince him the nectar was gone for good. The truth was that she'd hidden the other jar, stashed away for her own uses. Pulse and nectar was expensive because it was the key ingredient in multiple narcotics, sink and rehype being two of them. Gavin jabbed her in the side with his cane. Ow! What the... Where's the rest of my rehype, cat? I don't have it. You searched my stuff. That's everything I had. More lies. You had a workshop. Had? Her stomach sank. Her sanctuary down at the docks was little more than a shack, tucked away down at the end of an alley, between a fish cannery and a warehouse. But it had been hers. Yeah. 
We torched it. He grinned. This is your place now. All her equipment. All her tools and notes and books. Gone? Heat rose in her chest and clawed at her throat. An explosion of angry daggers stab, stab, stabbed her mind. Vials and jars and tools littered the nearby table. She bit the edge of her lip and seethed. Her body trembled. Hey! Gavin poked her with his cane. Hey, no, no, can't put that down. She cocked her arm back, holding the jar, and sidestepped to line up on him. You burned my place down? Damn right we did. Why? She asked in pleading desperation. Maybe he was just messing with her. Put that down. If you hit me, you can kiss your chances of ever leaving here goodbye. She sank to the floor. The jar rolled from her limp grip and clattered across the stones. How long are you keeping me here? Gavin began to kneel, but winced in pain midway down and changed his mind. You owe me for the Bolson. Going right on that. He waggled his pointer finger as he did some mental math. Uh, give me... Six. No. You make uh, ten more batches of sizzle, and I'll consider a square. Ten? She scrambled to her feet. Kevin, what? Ten? Come on, no. That's... You, you can't do that. Gavin backed away from her, toward the lab's door. <laughs> I can do whatever I want, Cat. He tapped the door with his cane while still facing her. The door opened, and Droopy leveled a crossbow into the opening. Before stepping out, Gavin said, I said ten. Make it an even dozen batches, huh? That's got a better ring to it. Cat glared at him. Later that evening, Droopy showed up and forced her back to her cell. The wall rose back into place. She had herself a good long cry after she was alone and in the dark. What hurt the most was the loss of her notes. Years of work gone. She could replace the equipment, but some of the things she'd written down she would never remember. That, and the shack itself. It had been small, not much bigger than the cell she was currently stuck in, but it was hers. The owner of the fish cannery rented it to her in exchange for the medicine she made for his son. At least until he died at the age of 12. That happened a year ago, but he continued renting the place to her as a thank you for helping his son. Laying in the cot, she pulled the thin blanket up to her chin and wondered if the jar of Poulsen she'd hidden was still safe. What she'd learned about the substance she would never need to write down. The discovery she'd made would stick with her forever. Now, she just needed a way to get out, and soon. If the nectar sat unstirred for another week, it would harden and be worthless. With sleep closing in, she thought about how she could make more batches of sizzle, and fast. Chapter 4 To say the region of the pits where Miss de Boer lived was nice would be a creative use of language. The smells were less pungent, but the screams fewer, and the oppressive feeling of someone watching you diminished, but it was still a far cry from being nice. 
Sinek squeezed the location of Miss DeBoer's home from a squeaker. The scamp pissed himself when Sinek caught him by the arm and pulled him close. Sinek's visage was a broken landscape of scars. They marked cuts from glass, knives, a saw, brass knuckles. There was a big splotchy one from a flamer that started at his neck, crossed his nose and left eye, and ended on the top of his head where he was missing hair. His left cheek was a mess of swirled tissue from a big bastard that tried to turn his face into ground meat against a stone wall. Lights were on in Miss DeBoer's two-story home. They shined from windows on both the ground and second floor. It was one of four homes tucked into a huge dead-end stone hall, either an incomplete path torn through rock by a metric's borer, or dug specifically for these well-to-do citizens. The pits was littered with hundreds of the former, tunnels that dead-ended either because the tunneling machine broke down, or because it was determined there was nothing worth continuing to mine for. Sinek watched figures milling around each of the homes from his spot on a catwalk 40 meters away. Guards, from the way they carried themselves and rested hands on the hilts of belted swords. A couple wore crossbows on their backs. Me scuttled along the walkway to where it ended at a rock wall. From there, he dropped to a rooftop with a soft thump. He paused and kept his eyes on the guards. He looked for an easy attack vector and noted all four homes the guards were protecting had gas lamps out front. The moment he turned the valve and the gas lamps died, the guards were fast to light lanterns, fan out, and start looking for the cause. Cynic was faster. He became a blur of movement, his waxed canvas cloak flapped in his wake as he crouch ran up to the first guard. The man was alone, holding his lantern high. Cynic slammed into his side, ripped the lantern out of his hand, tossed it away. He bounced the guard's head against the cold stone ground with a wet smack and was moving again, all before the lantern turned projectile shattered in a fiery spill. He paused, heart thrumming. The other guards would be so easy to kill. They were lead sticks stuck in mud. He was a mercurial razor drawn through an oil slick. He shook the thought aside and told himself to stay on task and shimmied up the outer wall to the second floor of Mr. Boris. He threw his cloak flat against a window and hit it with his elbow, but then slipped through the opening and shook the glass off the sticky wax. There was a large dresser across the way and he threw each drawer open, starting with the top. No locket. The guards were shouting from in the street below, but two voices were coming closer. One of them said he was going to check inside. Mr. Boar's front door opened and footsteps crossed the threshold. Cynic dragged a chest from the foot of the bed to the door and spotted a small box atop the dresser he'd gone through. The jewelry box was hiding in plain sight. He jammed the flat tip of his blade into the lock and popped it open with a rough twist. Inside was a pair of plain silver rings and the locket. Cynic held his prize up, then gathered the chain into his hand and stashed it in a pouch. He left the way he'd come and turned the gas valve back on. The sudden return of light in the streets caused a new commotion and the guards once again scrambled to make sense of what had happened. By the time they were back in the street looking for an answer, Sinek was long gone. It had been three days since Sinek was in Tanner's bar. Finding Miss DeBoer's and robbing her had only taken one, but he liked to lay low after a job, 
No sense in collecting the reward right away. She might have ears listening. The bar was its typical half full. Tanner finished pulling a brew for a thirsty drinker and joined Cynic. He reached for the locket. Show me the silver first, Cynic said, and he pulled his prize away from Tanner. Tanner rolled his eyes and reached into the satchel at his waist. He made two piles of six coins and gestured to them with a little flourish. Good? Cynic handed the locket over and scooped up the coin. Yeah. That contract is open now. I know. It's part of why I waited to collect on this one. Tanner massaged his hairline. There's something I didn't tell you last time. I was hoping you wouldn't get a chance to take it. What? Cynic asked and added, Why? Uh, uh, rumor has it this guy might know a thing about... Tanner paused and eyed Cynic's right arm. That. Cynic's arm twitched. A spasm caused the motors and servos to hiccup. The moment it moved, Tanner backed away from the bar. Damn thing. Me fuck up my bar again and you're paying for it. Cynic closed his eyes and took a few calming breaths. You need a dose. No. <clears throat> I'm fine. That wasn't a question, Cynic. You're losing it. Two silver. Cynic opened his eyes and glared. I don't... Oh, shit. His arm shot upward. The hand opened. The fingers twitched and clawed the air. I'm... He said, and wheeled his arm back down. But it only half agreed. It fought. Elbow pistons jerked it this way and that. Damn it, man, take the fucking dose, Tanner said. He hurried down the bar, opened a drawer, pulled a vial out, and rolled it across the bar. Cynic's brass and steel limb swung an arc and snatched the tube of glass off the bar. The cybernetic hand held it for a moment, then crushed it. Shit, you owe me for that. Tanner said, and went to grab another. The rest of the bar's patrons were watching now, their conversations paused, their drinks ignored. Get your stupid arm under control and down this. I'm fine, Cynic said through gritted teeth. His arm swung around again and latched onto the bar's edge. It began to squeeze. Wood groaned and cracked under the intense pressure. No, you're not. Here. Tanner thrust the violet cynic. Take it, or I'm not giving you this contract. Cynic ripped the cork out with his teeth, spat it away, and dumped the sink into his mouth. The liquid was cooling peace, sung by a gentle woman. His eyes closed, and he sank into the bar. All tension washed away. A smile pulled at his lip. Okay, I'm good, he said. He lifted his arm and gave his ear a tug, walked his steel fingers across the bar. So, what's the mark I know about my arm? Tanner hissed in annoyance. You owe me four silver. Be happy I'm not charging you for that. He pointed to the place Cynic's arm had marred his bar. Another visual souvenir from the assassin's willful limb. I don't know, man. Rumors I've picked up just said they... might know something. That's all I got. Cynic was making to get up and leave. Hey, my four silver? <sighs> right. Cynic pulled four coins from his payment of twelve. You want this or what? Tanner held the card up. On it was an image of a hand holding a cane. Cynic took it and left. Ungrateful prick. Tanner shook his head and smiled.
Chapter 5 <whistles> Gavin whistled in amazement. There were three crates full of sizzle. Each crate held dozens of little vials stuffed with protective wood shavings. He rifled through the first crate, the second, and fished free a handful of the lucrative narcotics from the third. Beautiful, he said, smiling a cat. This. His handful of potent treasure clinked together. <laughs> Not you. Cat made a ha-ha, go fuck yourself face. You told me you needed a week to make a batch, and here you've gone and made three in as many days. Impressive. Let me go, Gavin. There's things I need to do. Gavin snorted a laugh. <laughs> no. Tell you what. You let me go. Do what I need. I just need a day. And I'll come back, make you a few more batches. This? Gavin dropped the vials back into the crate and waved at the others. Doesn't even cover half of what that missing jar of pulse and nectar cost me. You're not going any... A hard crack hit the ground above their heads. A groaned, no, that was punctuated by a second wet smack. A third, and two more. Gavin drew a knife and waved at a cat. Come here. Cat took a step back. No. Get over here, cat, or I'll split you open. Here. He pointed to the floor in front of him. Now. More muffled sounds of struggle filtered through the top floor. Cat did his bid, and Gavin locked her left wrist in a pair of shackles. He dragged her back to the cell and clasped the other end of the shackles to one of the cell's heavy metal bars. He eyed her, looking for clues, huffed, and left. The moment he was gone, she tried pulling her hand free. No use. It was stuck fast. The sounds of distress coming from above continued. She searched for anything within arm's reach that would aid her escape. In her cell, there was nothing. But over in the lab, there were all kinds of things. Tools, acids, and knives. And the wall was still down. If only she could make it over there. An idea that was as terrible as it was good jumped into her head. Terrible in what it required, good in what it did. She knelt and smashed her knee into her hand. Her first try was a success, and her effort was rewarded with a hard crunch and shooting pain. But her broken hand slipped out of the shackle. Cynic stalked the rooms and halls of the sprawling interior, cutting down, running through, and splitting open anyone he encountered. He slashed his blade through the throat of another, marking his sixth kill. A figure loomed into the end of the hall and lifted a weapon. Cynic flattened himself into the wall an instant before a bolt sailed through the space he'd been filling. He was a blur, a shadow chased by the sudden arrival of light, only there was no light here. The shadow reached its prey, and from it flashed an icy line of death. The squared edge of Cynic's blade cut a gash in the underside of the crossbow shooter's jaw. Nine inches of steel walked into the bloody portal and marched through bone, sinew brain and skin. The blade, poking out of the top of the man's skull, retraced its path out of the man's head, and Cynic's latest victim fell. At the other end of the hall, Gavin watched the hunched being look his way. Who the piss are you? He asked. When the figure ignored him, he said, 
What do you want? He tried to swallow the glob of terror crawling up his throat. <clears throat> Who sent you? Sinek wiped his blade clean on the dead man's shirt and stalked toward the man with the cane. Irrelevant. The contract is for you and your gang. Shit. A wave of memory, loss, and unrealized dreams flooded Gavin. All those times he could have, or should have, gone. Every path he might have walked ended here. Fiery pain massaged Cat's left wrist. In the wake of every angry caress rose a surging spike that made her wince. Disgust contorted her face as she eyed the vial of sizzle. The shards twinkled in the light of gas lamps. She popped the cork free and shook a shard onto the table. A wee taste would numb her entire body, but also fill her with cravings for hours afterward. She licked her finger, tapped the shard of sizzle, and wiped it onto her tongue. Right above her, Gavin yelled, No! Then the unmistakable sound of bone on wood cracked the floor. Why are you doing this? A new voice, born of old books and torn muscles, asked, Who took my arm? Cat strained to listen as fuzzy warmth sapped her mental energy. She fumbled with ingredients to make a small explosive. In a jar, she mixed two parts powder to one condenser agent, then added a pinch of ignition. She stirred nice and even and slow, churning all three together. The sizzle was in full effect now, and her brain throbbed. Her mouth went dry, her skin itched, and her eyes watered. She poured the bomb mixture into a vial, added a single drop of reactor, and stuck half a meter of fuse into it. She grabbed a candle and went to the cell. She took a lump of warm wax and molded it into a sticky pad and stuck the vial to her door's lock then used the candle to light the fuse, and ducked behind one of the lab's island countertops. Three seconds later, a soft crump sucked the air out of the room and thumped Cat in the chest. Her head swam, but she pulled herself together enough to grab a few things from the lab and shove them into a bag. She lit a second fuse and scuttled her way out of the basement, casting furtive looks as she went. Upstairs, a shadowy figure was kneeling on Gavin. The man's face was hidden, but light glimmered off a metal arm. The second much bigger explosive was about to go off, and with the way clear, she dashed to freedom. Moments later, a walloping thwomp rocked Gavin's hideout. Sinek had his knee planted in the middle of Gavin's back, pinning him to the ground. A name will suffice. A soft whump shook the ground. Sinek had enough time to wonder what it was, but Gavin's voice dispelled any half-formed ideas. What are you talking about? This, you ignorant fuck! Sinek punched the floor next to Gavin's head with his cybernetic right arm. Wood splinters were sent flying. Who did Malkin sell my arm to? Before Gavin could respond, a second, much louder explosion shook the ground and Cynic lost his balance. Gavin rolled away, stabbed Cynic with his cane, and got behind a door that he locked. Two explosions told Cynic it was time to leave. Chapter 6 Dr. Mortimer watched the two figures walk, one after the next, away from the gang's hideout. Dust was still falling from the second explosion. The pair was headed straight toward where he sat in a stoop. He whistled as they passed. 
In one hand, he held a coin. In the other, a vial. The fuck do you want? Sinek asked. And what's with the mask? You don't want to see my face, trust me. As for what I want, well, nothing much. Information is all. You killed Gavin, Kat said. No, he got away. Keep talking and you won't, Mortimer said. You stopped us, Kat said. Only to help. Here. He held the silver piece out for Cynic and the vial for Kat. What information do you want? Cynic took the silver. Kat looked the vial of bluish substance over. It was oil and metal, iron and smoke, all at once. Don't worry about that. I'll get what I need. Our trade is done. Once the pair had run on, Mortimer knocked on the door behind him. Gavin's second-in-command, Stumpy, stepped out. Looks like it's time to party, boys. What's the plan, Doc? Track them with this. Dr. Mortimer handed Stumpy a box with a small screen that showed a blinking dot. Then what? Then kill them, naturally. Gavin's goons dashed off, and Mortimer chuckled. Good luck, idiots. He dusted himself off and wandered back toward South Ma, whistling as he walked. Cynic and Cat headed down a wide tunnel. Both sides were lined with shanty shops and hovel homes. They teetered ten stories up. Kids ran across the rooftops, chasing each other, while down at ground level adults went about their business. They'd taken a seat on the ground, tucked up near a wagon loaded with crates. Cynic was making adjustments to his right arm while Cat pulled a few things from a bag. Why'd you follow me? Cynic asked. I didn't. I'm going this way too. Why'd you want to kill Gavin? It was a contract. Why were you there? I was a prisoner. He was forcing me to make him stuff. Drugs? Yeah. Cat, using only her right hand, was working on a device the size of a beer growler. What is that? Trap. What's in it? Oh, just some... Cynic pushed himself back. Oh, fuck me. Is that... Frailty? Cat smiled. You mess around with that shit? I wouldn't say I mess around with it, but since you failed to kill Gavin, I've got a feeling we'll be seeing him soon. Do you know how to make... I told Gavin that wacky doctor was no good... But this thing is amazing and let us right to you. Stumpy waved the box. Told you, Cat said. Cynic sprang to his feet, dragged Cat up, and the pair ran. They were down a long alley between two towering buildings. The massive walls were made of concrete pillars and steel girders. That's perfect, Cat said. Cynic dropped down from where he'd strapped a canister between a couple columns. That work for you? Yep. Just, whoa, careful. Don't bump that. She pointed to the ground. No, here. She knelt and touched a line of metal thread. Ah, what if someone else walks down this way? Cat shrugged. Life in the pits. The two goons in front took the worst of it. They walked right into the tripwire and toxic green liquid gushed from high on the wall. It washed over them and began eating away their skin. Stumpy kicked one of the two aside and waved his pals onward. So they have traps, who cares? We have Mortimer's tracker. The pair made their way inside a ruined factory. 
a place where Metric's mining equipment had been made and maintained. Now it was a maze of rusted walkways and rotted wood. Cold was seeping from Cat's bag and making her legs stiff. What in the world did he give me? She pulled Mortimer's vial out. Oh, piss. Hey! Stumpy yelled from behind them. Stop running and I won't torture you. Cat, we have to go. Do you know what this shit is? Don't know, don't care. I've heard about it, but... She considered hanging on to it. The things she would picked up about what it could supposedly do. Power an entire home, or serve as coolant for large machines. But she wasn't a mechanologist. What did she care about any of that stuff? I don't, she said to herself. Nice, you sit tight and I'll come kill you. Stumpy motioned for one of his men to move up. Go on, you got this. Cynic, let's go. He waved her to head further down the way to a ladder at their backs. I'll meet you in a second. Cute, protecting your friend. That's nice, but she's the one we're tracking, not you. I don't give two shits who or what you're tracking. You're all dead. I'm doing just fine, friend. We're not friends, and you should watch where you're walking. What? He took one more step, and the trap snapped closed on his leg. The serrated jaws bit deep. That was bad enough, but the real pain came a few seconds later, as his skin began bubbling with thick red blisters. They popped, and he fell over howling. Blood pooled around his leg even as more bubbling blisters climbed up his body toward his heart. In another few minutes, he would be reduced to a puddle of human goo. Cynic ran to catch up with Cat and found her at the top of the ladder, waiting for him. What was that? You don't want to know. Blood rot? She asked, and Cynic nodded. Thought so. Nasty. Yeah, well, it was my only trap. I was hoping they'd give up seeing that. Psh, it was worth a shot. This'll stop them. She held the vial up. A bomb? Not exactly. Poison? Inertia. Oh, shit. Your hand must be freezing. Isn't that what it does? Uh, more numb than anything. Here they come. Cynic nodded towards Stumpy and the three others. Get down here! Stumpy howled. Uh, no? Cat yelled back. How about you suck on this? She threw Mortimer's vial down at Gavin's goons. Come on, let's get out of here. Hang on, I want to... Oh, wow, that's nasty. I didn't know it did that. Oh, hey, you said you make drugs? Think you can make me sink? Of course, but it'll cost you. Cat smiled. 